we will get started um, with Dr. Nachman. And we're going to be going over the clinical aspects of IGAN. What is it? Who gets it? How's it diagnosed? And the treatment. And then we will go into Dr. Gillespie's portion. All right, take it over. Well, um, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. This is really um, a, a pleasure to do this. And I have to say that uh, some of those pre-test questions were, were difficult, but um, if I could start with a small anecdote, one of our uh, teachers, Dr. Gillespie and I, uh, for the question of what does the kidney do, he would say that the kidney does miracles. It turns red wine into yellow urine. So this is your introduction to bad nephrology jokes. Um, my, here are my disclosure, and um, uh, I do participate in clinical trials of IgA nephro uh, nephropathy, uh, and uh, by definition, because there are no currently uh, FDA-approved drugs specifically for IgA nephropathy, I will be mentioning some uh, medications that are off-label use but I don't have any personal financial relationship with any of the clinical trial sponsors. Next slide. So the outline of my talk is I'm, I'm uh, going to spend a couple of slides talking about uh, what the kidney glomerulus is because it's difficult to talk about glomerular disease without uh, making sure that we're all on the same wavelength as to what is a glomerulus. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about the background of IgA nephropathy, um, the epidemiology or pathogenesis, or who gets it, and, and how does IgA nephropathy happen, or at least what our understanding is. Um, what are the risk uh, factors of progressive disease? And I will touch very lightly on, on treatment. Um, and as I know that Dr. Gillespie will talk more about uh, the future of treatment in IgA nephropathy and, and other glomerular diseases. So this is a, uh, a very broad level slide of what the kidney is and how it works. Uh, each kidney is really a, made up of about a million units called the nephron. And um, each unit uh, is made of, uh, of a filter called the glomerulus and a long uh, tube called the tubule. Um, and if you want to think about it, each kidney is made of, of a million uh, spaghetti noodle and meatball, the meatball being the, the round red thing that you see there where the filtering of the blood occurs and the long tubule or the long spaghetti is where the uh, early uh, precursor to urine is regulated and where water and salt is regulated. So uh, our, this is how our kidneys really maintain our blood chemistry in, uh, in a very tightly regulated uh, fashion. Next slide. So if we now focus on what the uh, glomerulus is, on the right-hand panel, you have a three-dimensional picture of what the glomerulus or what the filter is uh, and how it is uh, constituted. But what this filter is, is really a uh, a, uh, a, a tiny capillary blood vessels that uh, go round and round, and through uh, the walls of those of those capillary blood vessels is the act actual actual filtering uh, system of um, of the glomerulus. So in the middle panel, you have a photomicrograph uh, of a glomerulus. I don't know, um, and, and uh, this is a cross-section of a, a glomerulus, and on the left-hand panel is a schematic of what uh, the glomerulus looks like when you cut it and look at it under the microscope. 
And you can see those white round shapes are a cross section of the tiny blood vessels uh, through which the filtering occurs. And the space around those round circles is where the very early filtrate or the very uh, early precursor of urine, if you want, is collected uh, and where the yellow arrow goes up is where the early filtrate of urine will go through that uh, long tubule to get regulated where the salt and water uh, regulation occurs. Next slide. So now we're going to take a close-up schematic at one uh, blood vessel or one capillary loop uh, and you can see here in the middle is where the blood is and the yellow uh, cell that is surrounding this capillary tube loop is a blood vessel cell, it's an endothelial cell. Uh, around the blood vessel uh, there is this gray line that you can see and this is called the glomerular basement membrane and it's part of the filtering unit. And on the outside of the capillary loop, there's something that looks like a giant uh, octopus with a big eye. And that's a, a cell that's very important. It's called uh, a podocyte, or um, it's the, the uh, glomerular epithelial cell. Um, and in fact, the filter uh, function of the glomerulus is, uh, depends on this entire structure and then the integrity of the entire structure. Um, and uh, anything that damages any parts of those uh, structure will cause a dysregulation of the filtering of the blood um, in the urine. Next slide. Um, so here again is what I just described earlier with a, a different component. Uh, the last component that I've been mentioned is the, the red cell on the right hand side and that's the part of the uh, central part of glomerulus that keeps this architecture in place uh, um, in an intact way. Next slide. So frequently when we talk about glomerular diseases, there are two cardinal findings that give us a clue that the glomerular part or the filtering part of the kidney is not, uh, is, is affected by the disease uh, and potentially damaged. And the two things that uh, we as kidney doctors look at are uh, either an abnormal loss of protein in the urine, uh, also called proteinuria, or an abnormal loss of blood in the urine uh, or, or hematuria. And frequently when we look at the urine, we can uh, look at uh, what the red blood cells look like and if they are not looking like normal red blood cells, we can guess that these red blood cells are coming from the kidney and from a damaged glomerulus as opposed to coming from the bladder, for example. So protein in the urine or blood in the urine with these uh, damaged red blood cells give us a clue that uh, the glomerulus is not uh, working well or is affected by the kidney disease. Next slide. So, um, you know, now I'm going to talk more specifically about IgA and, and give an idea of uh, what IgA is or what does it represent in the world of kidney diseases or glomerular diseases. Um, so IgA nephropathy is uh, the most common glomerular disease in the world. And there is a sense that uh, IgA nephropathy uh, or the, the incidence of IgA nephropathy may be increasing. So if you can click twice, uh, you will see uh, what these lines are. Uh, the very top line is a disease called FSGS, which is characterized by loss of heavy amount of protein in the urine. And the dotted line with, with a red uh, arrow next to it is IgA nephropathy. And this is a beautiful study from the Kaiser Permanente on the, on the West Coast. And 
by virtue of how the Kaiser Permanente is structured, the very large health plan, uh, they can actually do good epidemiologic study and estimate if the incidence, uh, so the number of new cases occurring within a population is changing with time. And you can see here that in the last 10 or 15 years, there seems to have been an increase in the incidence of IgA. Whenever we look at data like this, we wonder if this is a true increase in in the frequency of a disease or whether we are recognizing it better uh, and paying more attention to it. Next slide. Um, IgA nephropathy does not seem to affect people of all races or ethnicity equally. Um, so in that, and this is from the same uh, study, uh, so in that uh, schematic bar graph, uh, the dark almost black uh, bars are IgA nephropathy. But you can see here that um, different diseases tend to affect different ethnic groups or different racial groups differently. So uh, the very large uh, bar, gray bar um, in the black non-Hispanic group, for example, represents FSGS. And you can see that among uh, Blacks, uh, FSGS is very common, uh, but IgA nephropathy is that teeny tiny little bar, uh, the fourth bar. So it's quite uncommon among uh, African Americans or people of African descent. On the other hand, if you if you go to the uh, Asian non-Hispanic group, you can see that IgA is. Uh, more commonly seen than other uh, glomerular diseases. So there has been a well-recognized uh, geographic and ethnic variation in the frequency of IgA nephropathy of, uh, uh, around the world, and it is most commonly seen uh, uh, in East Asia, along the Pacific, so China, Japan, Korea. And as you move west from uh, the Far East, uh, into uh, Europe, the incidence decreases, and in Europe it's more than in North and South America. But again, within each continent, or especially the North American continent, there is a difference in uh, the, the frequency of the disease uh, among people of different ethnicities. Next slide. Not only is the frequency of the disease different uh, among different uh, ethnic groups, but there is a sense also that uh, folks of Pacific Asian descent uh, may have more severe disease and are uh, uh, possibly more likely to develop uh, chronic kidney disease or renal failure from IgA nephropathy compared to other ethnic groups. So on the left-hand panel there, the blue line at the top are people of other ethnicities and the uh, red line are Asians. And this is uh, the likelihood of uh, a progressive renal function, uh, renal function deterior deterioration towards end-stage kidney disease. Um, new slide. So what do we know about why IgA nephropathy happens or how does it happen? And this is a little bit uh, of jargon and I uh, apologize for this, but IgA is one of the major types of antibodies that our blood produces or that our body produces. And antibodies are what our body normally produces to protect us from viruses and bacteria and allergens out there. And we have different types of antibodies in our, in our body. Um, and the, the most common one is uh, called IgG, but IgA uh, is uh, special in the sense that it is thought to uh, be part of our um, mucosal immune system, meaning uh, the interface between our body and the outside world. Uh, so IgA is common in saliva. It is also produced by the lining of our gut, for example. 
um, and is uh, thought to play an important role at that interface between, uh, between our bodies and the outside world. There are two types of IgA, IgA1 and IgA2. And IgA1, so, so all immunoglobulins have this special type of molecule shape that looks like a Y. Uh, with, you can see here the, the yellow and red part uh, are the, the stem, if you want, and the two branches are part of the business part of the uh, antibodies uh, uh, that specifically recognize uh, foreign uh, objects or molecules. And IgA1 is the one that we are concerned about for IgA nephropathy, and the two red circles in the middle of this cartoon uh, uh, are uh, representing a region of the IgA1 molecule that normally, where normally special chains of sugars are attached to, uh, or the galactose part of the IgA. Suffice it to say that uh, we have learned in the last couple of decades that patients with IgA nephropathy seem to have fewer of these sugar moieties or sugar molecules attached to the IgA1 molecule. Not only, so we all have a variety of sugar molecules attached to IgA1, but patients with IgA nephropathy seem to have fewer of the sugars attached there. Not only are there fewer sugar molecules attached, but there seem to be a propensity to make antibodies to these under galactosylated or um, IgA molecule that don't have as much sugar as, as normal. So it's as if this uh, IgA1 molecule that doesn't have as much sugar as, as expected is itself causing an immune response to it. Uh, next slide. So what might happen is that there are two uh, thought pro uh, lines of thought. One of them is that if the IgA1 molecule is, uh, doesn't have as much sugar, maybe it's making it more sticky and more likely to deposit uh, in the glomerulus, uh, or, and, or if there are antibodies, IgG antibodies to the galactose deficient IgA1, that now big blob of IgG, IgA stuck to each other, gets caught into the filtering uh, system and deposits in the in the kidney. So just to orient you, uh, remember I mentioned the gray line there, which is the, the basement membrane in the glomerulus. Uh, in the top right part of the image is where the blood would be. And the, the green, uh, we call them foot processes, but the green structures there on the other side of the basement membrane come from that uh, epithelial cell. So you can see here that the thought is that what happens is that this abnormal IgA1, if it is attached to an IgG uh, molecule, also can get trapped in that filter and it accumulates in that part of the glomerulus uh, and the capillary loop. Next slide. So this is what we think are the initial steps of IgA nephropathy. And once this happens, we believe that when the, the uh, IgG attaching to the IgA triggers a set of inflammatory processes where it is depositing in the kidney, and this is it's this inflammation uh, that causes the damage to the kidney. Next, uh, next slide. So what does IgA nephropathy look like and what are the types of IgA nef nephropathy or where do we see it? So in the vast majority of, of cases, patients may have kidney disease and nothing else going on. We see uh, blood in the urine, we see protein in the urine, 
uh, but we don't see disease outside of the kidney, so to speak. Um, in a subset of patients, uh, if we look at the kidney, it looks just like IgA nephropathy, but they can also have uh, disease manifestation that affect other organs. And in those cases, we call it IgA vasculitis, and the old eponym for this was Hinox Schoenlein purpura. Uh, and frequently, patients with IgA vasculitis, especially children, can have a rash, uh, typically in the lower extremities, but they can also have joint pain, they can have abdominal pain, diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea. Uh, there are also uh, some groups of people or patients that have IgA nephropathy that we think may be linked to an underlying uh, process uh, that is uh, separate from the IgA or maybe perhaps triggering the IgA nephropathy. So there's epidemiologic data uh, and some uh, indirect evidence that uh, inflammatory bowel disease or maybe celiac disease could be an underlying uh, phenomenon that uh, gives a propensity for a patient to have IgA nephropathy. Uh, patients with uh, severe liver disease can have IgA deposition in the kidney. By and large, we think that the process for this is different. Um, more recently, patients with severe uh, MRSA infection that you may have heard of can have a deposition of IgA in the kidney, but that too is thought to be a slightly different uh, mechanism. There are other autoimmune diseases that may be associated with IgA uh, nephropathy, and very rarely uh, or infrequently, there are families where IgA nephropathy seems to, to be common. Next slide. So this is a very complicated slide, and I'm not going to go over it. This is just to bring back the idea that we think that there is a link between uh, inflammatory bowel disease or mucosal uh, immunity or a breakdown in, immuso, in, in mucosal immunity that seems to, where, where the IgA1 is usually formed and secreted, that maybe an inflammation in the mucosa, like in the gut, for example, can lead to a trigger or lead to eventually uh, making the IgAs that we think are the ones uh, depositing in the kidney and the culprit for IgA nephropathy. Next slide. So this is uh, what is called the Manhattan plot. So the, uh, uh, the, the group in Columbia did this beautiful study where they looked at uh, gene expression across our entire genome, all of our chromosomes, and they compared uh, uh, small areas of variation in our genetic makeup, uh, and they compared patients with IgA nephropathy with, with healthy control. And lo and behold, the genes that they identified as being associated with IgA nephropathy seem to be genes that normally would uh, provide us with mucosal immunity or integrity of our mucosa. So again, this idea that there is a link between uh, our, our interface uh, and the integrity of our interface between our body and the outside world seems to play a role in, uh, in the development of IgA nephropathy. Exactly how these dots are connected is not yet uh, elucidated, at least not fully. Next slide. So how does IgA nephropathy present? Uh, there are a spectrum of, of uh, presentations. Uh, some patients can have visible blood in the urine, typically at the time when they have an infection, uh, frequently around the time that they have a sore throat or strep throat or an upper respiratory tract infection. And they can have clear blood in the urine and it's very scary and it brings them to the attention to their physician. More often than not, very frequently, this acute event gets better on its own after a few days. Uh, and, and the scary event can actually 
but B is associated with a transient loss of kidney function. Um, there are, and in fact, the majority of patients may have protein and blood in the urine at such low level that it can go on for a long time and they may be completely oblivious to it because they're not feeling anything. So uh, that is one uh, also possible presentation of IgA nephropathy and frequently people are diagnosed because they're having a routine check for sports physical, for example, or for uh, insurance purposes. Um, in a minority of patients, the inflammation of the kidney can be severe enough that the loss of kidney function is rapid. Uh, because of point number two there and the fact that many patients can have this and not know it, frequently patients can present with already some uh, loss of kidney function. The word nephrotic syndrome is a, um, is a group of diseases that are typically characterized by fairly severe loss of protein in the urine and severe swelling of the leg. That is a minority of patients with IgA nephropathy. The majority present with more blood and less protein in the urine. Next slide. So what are the risk factors for having a more progressive loss of kidney function? Uh, the presence of high blood pressure is a risk factor if at the time of diagnosis we already detect some loss of kidney function, that's a sign that things are more likely to progress. Patients who have a familial form of IgA nephropathy are more likely to progress. But by far the most important um, factor that helps us determine who's more likely to progress is uh, how much protein they have in the urine and how long and what is the duration of the uh, abnormal loss of protein in the urine. Next slide. So uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially what it says, you can see on the left-hand panel, this is uh, the, the likelihood of um, survival without loss of kidney function. Uh, and and uh, you can see that uh, at the very top line, that's a solid line in black, people who have very little loss of protein in the urine tend to do very well for a very long time. But people who have who are losing one and a half or three or more grams of protein uh, per day uh, have a uh, uh, worse outcome with respect to uh, loss of kidney function. Next slide. So this is a slide that's complicated. And again, I'm not going to go over it. But it's there to tell us two things. If you look at the pathology uh, of the kidney in IgA nephropathy, there are different uh, uh, types of inflammation that you can see. And uh, in the next slide, um, uh, Many groups around the world, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, many groups around the world have uh, pathologists that analyze the pattern of inflammation in the kidney of patients with IgA nephropathy, and they have come up with uh, five criteria that, uh, by scoring these, these uh, aspects uh, or characteristic of the type of inflammation, uh, we can get a better idea of who's likely to progress and, and who is not. So if you've had a kidney biopsy with the IgA, you may have heard of the NESTC score, and this is where this is coming from. It is an additional tool that we can use to estimate who is more likely to progress uh, and who is less likely to progress. Next slide. Um, the other very important thing I mentioned earlier that um, uh, the amount of protein that is lost in the urine is a strong indicator that we can use to know who is at risk of progressing from who is not. So the, the left-hand panel is very similar to the one I showed you before. On the right-hand part of the slide, uh, what this is telling us is the other piece that we have learned is that Regardless of how bad the protein loss in the urine was to start with, if we can bring it down to 
less than a gram a day or less than half a gram a day, then the outcome is much better. So uh, you can see here that group one, group two, and group three has had the same uh, kidney survival over the long run, even though these three groups had uh, different levels of protein to start with. Next slide. So a treatment of IgA nephropathy, uh, you may want to do 10 clicks here very fast. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, this is there to tell us that really over the years, um, many different treatments have been uh, tried in generally speaking relatively small studies to look at what can help in IgA nephropathy. And I'm certainly not going to go over each one of those in detail. Um, there are two on that list uh, that are very important. Uh, the number one is called ACE inhibitors and or ARDs. These are uh, a type of blood pressure medication that affect the way the kidney filters uh, blood. And uh, the third one in the, uh, on that list are glucocorticoids, so, uh, so prednisone, for example. And these are the two that are, uh, for which we have the most data so far. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, there have been many studies uh, done, and uh, I'm going to just highlight uh, what probably have been the largest uh, and quite influential studies of recent years, influential in how we are thinking about uh, developing uh, better treatments uh, for IgA nephropathy. Um, this study was conducted in Germany. Next slide, please. And it's a very interesting uh, study design. They took patients with IgA nephropathy and they said, okay, what would happen if we really maximize uh, supportive care? And supportive care is defined as very good blood pressure control, use of these type of blood pressure medications I mentioned before, uh, but also use of uh, statin drugs, uh, smoking cessation, healthy diet, etc. And they followed those patients for, for six months. And if they were able to achieve a reduction of protein loss in the urine to less than 0.75 grams a day, uh, just by doing the supportive measure, then they did not add any uh, immunosuppressive uh, treatment. If after those six months of maximal supportive care, the patient continued to lose protein in the urine, then they were randomized to either receiving prednisone alone or receiving prednisone plus a more aggressive form of immunosuppression with cyclophosphamide and azathioprine. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, what the study showed us, uh, first of all, before I go through this slide, uh, what was very interesting in, in that study design, fully a third of patients got better just with supportive care alone. And that was a very important message of the study is that if we really maximize these supportive cares, a, a substantial group of patients will do very well and we can avoid using immunosuppressive medication. Um, now, looking at what happened among those who did need immunosuppressive medication uh, versus just supportive care alone, we've learned that immunosuppressive medication did help reduce the protein loss in the urine. But the next slide shows that even though there was an improvement in the protein loss in the urine, it did not seem to make a big difference in terms of uh, preserving kidney function in the long run. Now, this study uh, was a little bit a victim of its own success uh, because I don't think that they anticipated that fully a third of patients would end up not being randomized to immunosuppression or not. So at the end of the day, this lack, this apparent lack of benefit in terms of protecting the kidney function in the long run uh, may have been that there weren't enough patients in, in the two groups that got randomized. 
uh, be that as it may. The next big study that was published uh, again in the recent past is the testing uh, trial. And this was a global study predominantly in, in, um, in uh, uh, East Asia and Australia. Um, uh, next slide. And in that study, patients were randomized uh, to uh, prednisone or no prednisone. And the study ended up being stopped uh, early because of um, a more frequent number of serious adverse events in the prednisone group. Next slide. Nevertheless, this is one of the largest studies uh, ever done in the group. You can see here that there were about 350 patients. And this is a slide describing what happens to the protein uh, in the urine after treatment with prednisone. And you can see that uh, the, the black line on the top are patients who received placebo. The amount of protein loss in the urine was diminished or decreased among those who received prednisone or methylprednisolone, sorry. Uh, the next slide, uh, and this is uh, what happened to the kidney function in the two groups. And here it's the reverse lines. The top line are those who received methylprednisolone, meaning their uh, kidney function uh, was better and was better preserved over time compared to those uh, that received placebo. So in that study, there is a, a suggestion that using prednisone, uh, uh, corticosteroids, prednisone, uh, can be beneficial in, prevent, in preventing the progression of kidney disease. Uh, these two studies are not the end all and be all. Uh, the testing study is now uh, uh, reforming into a, uh, a new trial, global trial, where we're going to try to study uh, a slightly different dosing of methylprednisolone and trying to get the benefit without the adverse event, so to speak. Um, next slide. But there are really a number, I think Dr. Gillespie will mention this, I think there are uh, seven or eight or nine different uh, types of trials that are ongoing now in, in IgA nephropathy trying not only uh, different uh, forms of uh, corticosteroids, but uh, molecules that target other inflammatory processes in the kidney uh, that are ongoing. Uh, I, I mentioned this one um, in the middle because it's one that is an interesting approach where, uh, you remember I mentioned uh, that we think that it's the mucosal immunity that is affected in IgA nephropathy, and this uh, study uses a form of corticosteroids that is meant to target the mucosal immunity in the gut, hopefully without as many of the um, effects of corticosteroids on the rest of the body. Next slide. So in summary, uh, IgA is the most common glomerular disease worldwide. There are differences in ethnic uh, groups with respect to not only the likelihood of getting IgA nephropathy, but the severity of disease. Uh, we've known that, uh, we've learned that the severity of protein loss in the urine is a indicator of uh, the risk of progressing, uh, progressive loss of kidney disease. We have a paradigm by which we think we understand how IgA nephropathy happens uh, with respect to the molecule itself. Um, and uh, the treatment is really evolving and it's really a very exciting time to be in, in nephrology and in glomerular disease and in IgA specifically because there are so many different approaches that we are contemplating to target uh, with uh, therapeutics for the treatment of IgA. And that's uh, my part of the show. I'll hand it to, to Dr. Gillespie. Okay, thanks, Dr. Nachman. Um, it's a real treat to be talking um, after Dr. Nachman to all of you today about IG nephropathy. Um, it is near five o'clock on a Friday. Dr. Nachman, I was hoping you would show your slide with the different degrees of hematuria as displayed by beer and wine. <laughs> 
but for the patients on the phone, um, you've seen what gross hematuria can look like, um, different colorations, colors in your urine. So it's great to start off with what the disease is and the treatments. Um, and now I'm gonna talk to you about um, other potential treatments that are being studied. But I wanted to take a step back and just talk about the importance of clinical studies because in nephrology, we do need a culture shift. Um, most oncology patients, when they're in their cancer clinic or they get diagnosed, the next question becomes, okay, you've got cancer, so which protocol should we enroll you in? Um, and we need to have that mindset in nephrology. And like Dr. Nachman said, it's a really exciting time because for the first time, at least in the last 15 years I've been involved in, in this side of research, um, there, have been, there are more trials than ever for IgA nephropathy. So next slide, please. And so I'm calling this part, portion of the talk patients as partners in developing new therapies because um, I just want to make sure that patients like you guys know that there are many opportunities to get involved in developing new therapies. And it's certainly participating in a trial is one of them, but there's a great menu of other things you can do. For some reason, if you can't participate in a trial, there are other websites and other things you can be part of. And so I'll show you some of that menu here today. And so I've interacted with a lot of patients over the years, um, not just in clinic, but doing things alongside of what we do, and particularly in work groups that I've been involved with with Dr. Nachman and, and other kind of advisory boards. And um, the more they realize that, you know, no one's talked to them about a trial, the more upset they're getting. And that's a good reaction because again, we want patients knocking on our doors and asking about clinical trials. So here, Nicole is someone uh, we've worked with at the National Kidney Foundation Kidney Health Initiative as well. And she told me, I'm upset because no one has offered me a clinical trial, yet her graft had been failing for the past year. And when she specifically asked the nurse about a trial, the nurse didn't know what to say. So we think it's obviously not every nephrologist um, is, is conducting clinical research. However, hopefully they can at least point patients to where to other resources where they can find a trial. So you'll see some of that in my slides today. Um, just a word about what I do. So Covance is a contract research organization. And so when a sponsor has a drug that they're developing for kidney disease, um, as an example, they'll hire a company like Covance to help them execute the trial. In addition to running the trial, I've worked with sponsors over the years to help develop the protocols, write the protocols. And then once we're working together and start the, the trial, we go to sites and investigators like Dr. Nachman to actually conduct the trial on his patients. And so it's, it's a team approach where we all work together. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna just touch, start with the Advancing American Kidney Health um, Executive Order. So this was signed by the president last summer and there are lots of pieces to it, but overall it's really become a game changer because it's raised the visibility of kidney disease and it really tries to promote the treatment and care for kidney health and not kidney failure. So we're all sick and tired of talking about dialysis all the time. We wanna talk about how to avoid dialysis. And if you look at the bottom of the slide there, there are three major goals of this executive order. But the one I really just wanna focus on is the idea of reducing the number of Americans developing kidney failure by 25% by the year 2030. And so to me, that just screams out to reduce the number of people developing kidney failure, we, we need better therapies and even novel therapies to slow progression, keep GFR and proteinuria where they are in addition to if we can improve it so we don't progress to needing dialysis or needing transplants. Next slide. So just to show you what the unmet need in nephrology has been, um, a new molecular entity is a drug that has never been approved for another um, indication or disease before. So for example, you may have heard about the drug canafaglozin, which is an SGL2 inhibitor from the Credence trial last year. This drug was first approved for type 2 diabetes, just for glycemic control. And then as the years went on, they studied, they decided to study kidney patients in particular. And thankfully, they found that 
this drug offered not only cardio cardiology protection, but also renal protection. In, in other words, this drug was found, found to slow down the progression to end-stage renal disease, which was fantastic because in diabetic kidney disease, it's been 18 years since the first drugs were approved, ACE and ARB medications to treat it. So this was a real win for nephrology last year. Axar gel is another one, um, initially approved for infantile spasms, and then later got approved for, um, for people with edema. But the, the new molecular entities that have never been approved for everything, anything are listed here in a, an 11-year time period. And as you can see, the drugs that are listed on the left, and you can see the years approved, the indications are things like anemia and hyperkalemia, secondary hyperparathyroidism. So these are labs that we all want to improve in our kidney patients, but treating the actual cause and, and of the kidney disease has been a little bit um, of a hard um, nut for us to crack. And so you don't see anything listed there for, um, for IgA nephropathy, for FSGS, for lupus nephritis. That's not to say there hasn't been a lot of work done, but unfortunately we're not quite there yet. And so another comparison is if you look in a two year time period, 2015 to 2017, there were 99 new drugs approved. 29 of those 99 were for cancer, but only four of them were for CKD. So I show this slide just to show you that while we do have standard of care treatments for, for our diseases, um, we are looking for more novel therapies. Next slide, please. And um, as Dr. Nachman mentioned, there are no approved therapies for IG nephropathy. It was discovered, it was characterized, IG nephropathy was characterized in 1968. So 52 years later, we still don't have a drug approved for it. So I tell you that just to kind of stir up a sense of urgency. We don't want to wait another 50 years. We, we want something around the corner in the next few years, and, and we need your help to, to get there. Okay, so what's a clinical study? Um, just to quickly go through some definitions. This is research where we use human volunteers, which we also call participants or subjects, and the goal is to add to our medical knowledge um, and to improve public health. The intervention in a clinical trial is the thing that's being tested. This is usually a new medication, but it can also be a procedure or program. If the intervention is a substance or drug, we call it investigational product. But if it's a program like a low salt diet as the intervention to improve high blood pressure, that's another intervention we're, we're trying to implement to improve things. Next slide, please. So there are different types of clinical studies, and on the far left, I've listed interventional studies, in other words, clinical trials. So this is what I am involved with um, every day, and, and Dr. Nachman is our, an investigator in many of these trials. And this is where patients get assigned or randomized to either the intervention group or a group that the placebo group, so you can compare what happens between the two groups. Um, the goal is to determine the safety and the efficacy, in other words, how well the intervention works in our patients. And what we wanna see is that the intervention group does a little bit better than the placebo group, and then we can go along and, and hopefully get that new therapy approved. So a simple um, example is, phosphorus, um, hyperphosphatemia. So when you have a new phosphate binder, that would be your intervention um, and you test it to make sure that the phosphorus levels go down. In the middle, there's another group of studies called observational studies. And um, these kind of, this kind of research is done as part of routine medical care. And so there's no, um, there's no new thing necessarily being given, but Something is happening as part of clinical care and we're looking at the effects of that. I'm gonna skip over to qualitative research because um, as, a, as a patient, if you can ask to be part of a clinical trial and interventional study in the far left, an observational study is something that's done um, kind of more in the office and looking at data, but qualitative research is another area where you can raise your hand and, and try to be part of. And with qualitative research, you're using our observations to collect data, and this is in the form of speaking to patients. Um, you want to get truthful reporting, interviews, focus groups, and surveys done to gain a deeper understanding about that group of people. So for example, um, there have been many interviews conducted in FSGS patients, for example, to understand their symptoms with the goal of developing patient-reported outcome measures. 
And so again, not all research involves an intervention or a drug or a program, but soliciting information about your experience really helps us um, determine if a drug was working or not. So the other the way, way I'll say that is, hopefully in the next few years, we'll have at least two or three new drugs approved for um, FSGS in this example. But in interviewing patients, if one of those drugs does a little bit better in helping the leg swelling, for example, that's good to know because patients with more severe leg swelling will probably want to take that drug for both treating their FSGS, but also that patient reported outcome of leg swelling. Next slide, please. And so how long does it take and how much does it cost? Well, Unfortunately, getting a one drug approved is very costly and, and takes a really long time. Um, there have been estimates that it can cost up to $2.6 billion to get one drug approved and take as long as at least 10 years. And so on the upper left there, you can see that at the start, we can have anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 substancing since entering the preclinical phase, excuse me. <clears throat> And this is where we look at the drug in animals and in the labs. And so we can try to cut down the number of drugs through those preclinical studies, but it can take up to six years before we even get to testing patients. And so by the time you're testing patients, then you enter clinical testing there in the middle. And um, this is where we go, we talk about phase one, two, and three testing. And really from those five to 10,000 substances, maybe only five, investigational products will actually move into human testing. Um, this part of clinical testing takes up to six to seven years and will take up to several thousands of patients. So as an example, you may have been hearing about the new um, anemia studies that are being studied for this class of drugs called hip stabilizers. And um, some of these programs and trials are already done and, and one is being evaluated by the FDA. But in one sponsor's program, it's taken over 9,000 patients to study um, and hopefully that drug will get approved. But just to, to, to show you, we need a lot of patients to participate in trials to get even one drug approved. And so, so now we've moved from clinical testing in phase one, two, and three, and of the five products, maybe only one will get a full FDA approval. Um, after it gets approved, we still wanna consider looking at that drug to look at the safety over years. We don't just wanna stop there. We wanna make sure that continued use of that drug is still safe for patients. And so we've got post-approval research that happens too. Next slide, please. Um, so we conduct trials to determine a couple of things that I've listed on the left, and there are many benefits to trial participation, but there are also risks to trial participation. So um, I'm not gonna go through all these bullets, but we recognize as researchers that when a patient is participating, they are you know, sacrificing their time and a lot of other things, um, in including maybe they're nervous and, and their emotion to be part of these trials. Um, but we wanna reassure you that what we're doing, we're doing this in the safest way possible. If you go to the next slide, safety is the most important thing. It's not making sure that the drug works. It, it really is, it does a drug work in, in a safe setting. And so I've listed a couple of things here that um, comes from guidance from the FDA to ensure that at every level, the protocols that we offer to you um, are safe. Next slide, please. And for the question of why do we need to conduct trials, I just want to tell you the quick story of anemia. So um, erythropoietin first got approved in 1989. And so over the next few years, Patients were, we were giving this to patients for a number of years. Um, but then in 2006, there was a big study, there were two studies that showed that getting patients to certain levels of hemoglobin was actually harmful. And so that caused a big pause in, in, to make us understand what we were doing, but it also caused us to continue doing research. But because of that information that came out in 2006, it forced um, a lot of our guidelines to be changed. It, it forced a black box warning given by the FDA to these drugs. Another study continued during that time and also showed harm. And all in all, it basically showed us that just because we're giving drugs for many years, 
that's the importance of following patients for safety. And so um, the good news for a little while was in 2012, a very new drug got approved. But again, safety continuing after those approvals showed that it was actually harmful. So it got removed from the market a year later. Um, so the point is, is that, again, while we want to get drugs approved, safety remains the importance before they get approved and, and, and really afterwards, too. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's move on and, and talk a little bit more about IgA nephropathy. This is a slide put together by Nefcare. And just five years ago, in 2015, when you look at the number of FSGS and IJ trials, there were only two. Two FSGS trials in phase two and three, and none, zero in IJ nephropathy. Next slide, please. If you fast forward to 2019, just four years later, look at the boom of activity. Just looking at IJ nephropathy, there were 12 studies in phase two and three. So that's really exciting. Um, a lot of studies in FSGS, and I don't know if you can see the bottom there, more studies in lupus nephritis and diabetic kidney disease. Next slide, please. And so as of March is when I looked at this data, there are eight trials for IJ nephropathy already underway. And every couple of months, this changes with new trials getting added. So this is a really exciting time in nephrology. Um, the challenge is for investigators like Dr. Nachman is to find enough patients to be able to enroll in these, in these trials um, because we want every, we need more shots on goal to make sure we we um, we get to um, a therapy that gets approved. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's trials, but let's take a step back and and um, explore again how patient feedback and your voice really helps us throughout the whole process of drug development. Next slide, please. And so. Back in December 2016, the 21st Century Cures Act was signed into law. And if you look at the four articles, I've, I've circled the third one, where the goal is to speed up development. And right there in law, you can see that patient-focused drug development and patient experience data is really important and being prioritized by the FDA. So somebody once said to me um, two years ago, oh, it, it's like the new thing to be talking to patients. It's not the new thing. Um, it's been going on for years, but it's also the law. And so I think that's really important for patients to recognize that the FDA wants us to talk to you to help better inform what we're doing in trials and in research. Next slide, please. And so, again, the FDA has been involving patients since 1991, um, starting with their advisory committees. And then on the left, this is just from the FDA website, you can go to the FDA website and type in patient involvement and find a lot of things that you can get involved with. On the right, here's one guidance they put out on getting patient-reported outcome measures in 2009. And in CKD, I've listed some of the things, um, some of the other work that's going on across a lot of our diseases. Next slide, please. And so patient feedback really does impact what the FDA decides. And so the example on the left is for a device, an OBC device. This trial was run but did not meet its original endpoint in 230 patients. So when the FDA saw this result, they actually sponsored a survey and asked patients, would you be willing to accept the risk of this device for the benefit of weight loss? And they, they asked 540 patients. And because of the patient's survey results, even though the primary endpoint, even though the trial itself failed, the patient's responses in the survey led the FDA to actually approve this device. It was the first OBC device of its kind approved since 2007. And again, really based on patient feedback. So it's really important for you to look for opportunities to provide us with feedback and provide the FDA with feedback on what matters most. Another example is this um, patient preference data in a drug label. So if you type in any drug and type in um, prescribing information, that's essentially the drug label. It tells us physicians how to use the drug. Well, rituxim, rituximab has been around since 1997. It was approved for cancer back then. Um, you, you know that we use it in several um, nephrotic diseases um, off-label. But in 2017, the, the company did a formulation study. Instead of getting, uh, giving it IV over one and a half hours infusion, they tested it in a subcutaneous formulation. So this is like a, a five-minute subcutaneous shot, not even five minutes, really, probably just under a minute. And um, the results of this led to the introduction for the first time ever in 
the patient in the drug label of a section called the patient experience data. And that's because they asked patients three simple questions about did they like the sub-Q formulation better or worse than the IV? And as you can imagine, most patients preferred getting a quick shot rather than sitting and getting an IV infusion over an hour and a half. So that was introduced into the label. And so again, what patients tell us really does impact what the FDA does. Next slide, please. So as you saw in the 21st Century Cures Act, the FDA mandated into law folk, um, hosting these FDA, I'm sorry, patient-focused drug development meetings. And the first 20 that occurred, of the first 20 that occurred, none were really focused on um, kidney disease. There was one about transplantation and we had some renal transplant patients attend. But this one was specifically focused on IgA nephropathy and this, was, this occurred in August 2019, co-sponsored by the National Kidney Foundation and the IgA Nephropathy Foundation of America, which is now merged with NephCure. And so you can see the agenda there. Basically the goal was to talk to patients and have them tell the FDA what mattered to them the most, what symptoms were the most worrisome, and also talk to them about clinical trials. And so Dr. Norman Stockbridge, um, the head of the cardiorenal division at the FDA, opened up the meeting and said to the patients, we want to know from you, um, you know, are you willing to participate in trials and what should we be looking at trial in trials? So throughout the, the day, there were um, surveys given to the patients that, in real time. And one of the questions was, how well does your current treatment reduce the most significant symptoms of your disease? Remember, these, these are all IgA nephropathy patients. And you can see the results there. 43% of patients said somewhat, and 13% said not at all. And so a gentleman named Mike, Michael, got up to the microphone and he said, I just got diagnosed with IgA nephropathy and 43% upsets me. That is a problem. He looked at Dr. He looked at Dr. Stockbridge and said, you're asking if we're willing to take risk in participating in trials? And he said, I know I am. And so it's not okay to have this many patients not satisfied with their treatment and, their, and control their symptoms. Next slide. And there was a lot of great conversation during that day about the effects of steroids. Um, I'm sure many of you have been on steroids. I've been on steroids for a week at a time here and there, and it's miserable even just for a week. So I can't imagine having to be on it long term. And I know Dr. Nachman is very mindful about the effects of steroids and balancing what it's doing for your kidney disease versus the everyday effects it's causing in you, whether it's you know difficulty sleeping or increased appetite or the longer term effects of, of ulcers and weight gain and so forth. So patient-centered outcomes is another area of study um, where we recognize that patients are the experts of their own experience. So we can talk to you about how to diagnose the disease and how to treat it, but you need to tell us um, what, what bothers you the most. And so on the left, again, I start with what's happening in the cancer world. More importantly, on the right, what's happening in the glomerular disease role, world. And so a lot of good people are thinking about this um, in different glomerular diseases. Next slide, please. And so I encourage um, all kidney patients to, to look at this website, um, SONG, which stands for Standardized Outcomes in Nephrology. These are a group of global surveys to compare what's important to providers and patients. So if you're a physician, you'll, you'll answer a set of questions, but if you're a patient or a caregiver, you'll answer the same set of questions. And this group kind of compares with the, with the healthcare professionals are telling us and what the patients are telling us. And so for Song GN, um, the initial findings were talked about last year, and um, they found that for the top four things, healthcare professionals and patients rated the top four similarly. So we're all concerned about the need for dialysis, proteinuria, mortality and dying from these diseases, and the occurrence of remission and relapse. But as the fifth most important thing to patients was cancer, whereas to the healthcare professionals, they rated cancer number eight. So that was very eye-opening. Not a surprise that patients are concerned about cancer, um, but cancer just wasn't as high a priority on the, on the provider list. And so no, recognizing gaps like this is really important because it helps us kind of steer in the direction of what we should be looking at in clinical trials. The goal of SONG, is that ultimately all of our trials will look for the same things in, in these diseases. And the, when I say things, it's the things that are concerning to patients as well. Next slide, please. <coughs>
another um, big push for from the FDA is gathering real world evidence. And so happy to share that the National Kidney Foundation is launching the first ever patient registry for CKD patients. I put the website there. You can also Google it. <coughs> Excuse me. And as you can see, this is going to be the first of its kind nationwide patient registry. <clears throat> the goal will, have, will be to have patients self-register, tell us about yourselves, and then ask you questions about your kidney disease. And so this will help us do a couple of things. Most importantly, I'll just focus on the right. We want to collect information from you and your thoughts about your disease where we can link it to your electronic records, um, we'll try to do that. Because if you tell us that your proteinuria is a gram, but, but maybe in the most recent um, visit, it was one and a half grams, that's good for us to know to be able to connect the dots. And from what you tell us in the registry, it will help us design trials that are more patient-centric. Again, more based on what is important to you and, and what you can do and feasible in a clinical trial. We also hope that this will really sound the alarm bells and, and make patients um, understand that participating in trials is important, whether it's an intervention trial or things like a registry or qualitative research. You need to help us understand um, what we need to, what other knowledge we need to gain for you. Next slide, please. And so when we talk about outcomes, um, we call that endpoints in clinical trials. And somebody asked me to put a history of um, regulatory, in, regulatory history in kidney disease. And it's really exciting to see that since 2008 and really 2012, there's been a lot of activity looking at endpoints. Why is this important? Well, my first clinical trial when I got to a CRO after fellowship was on vascular access. It was on dysfunctional catheters and dialysis. And what I didn't realize is what you see there in the orange box <clears throat> that there are 1,400 different ways to report how vascular access is working, which sounds crazy because if you've got that much variability in how we're reporting whether a catheter works or doesn't, whether an AV fistula or graph works or doesn't, that's too much noise and too much variability. So it's become really important for us to define the endpoints for each kidney disease so that when there are different protocols studying that disease, we're all looking at the same thing. Um, I've put stars there in the efforts where patients were involved in some of these work groups, which is wonderful. In one of the work groups I'm involved in, um, there was a phone call and us docs were talking about, you know, something about the disease. I think it was edema and leg swelling. And the patient on the trials, uh, on the work group said, look, that's important, but what about this, that, and the other thing? And so she really kind of educated us and, and to, to really open our eyes to not just what us, we as physicians are looking at, but, but really what the patient's experiencing. And so um, IJ nephropathy is there um, as one of the, the second efforts from a work group that Dr. Nachman and I were involved in, and we're looking at endpoints also for FSGS and other diseases. Next slide, please. And so the things I'm listing here, again, are ways to get involved. And so if you go to the Kidney Health Initiative um, website, there's a place where you can say, or you can contact me or Dr. Nachman, um, you want to be involved in some of this activity and we can connect you to those things. So it's also recognized that if patients tell sponsors what they think about a protocol early on, that's really helpful because I once saw a protocol that required 48 hour urine collections done five times in six months. And so I think doing a 24-hour collection can be a little bit challenging, but to collect your urine for 48 hours, especially if you work and you're in an office, where are you going to put the urine at your work and so forth? And so having patients tell sponsors directly what is possible and, and not really possible in a protocol is really important. And so we want patient input, not just at when we, not just in, again, enrolling patients, but how we write that protocol to begin with. Next slide, please. And the other way where we are, are hearing the patient voice more is, is in some of our, um, our uh, publications. And so when research comes out, we've asked patients to react to that research. And so here's an example of um, asking peritoneal dialysis patients what's important to them. And then uh, we had one of our patients respond 
to this art, to this research and, and to kind of talk about what's important to him. So this is in C. Jason, which is one of our peer reviewed um, periodicals. Next slide, please. And finally, I'll end with what I talked about at the beginning, that cultural shift that's really needed to view trial participation as an option for care. So when we see and diagnose patients with CKD and, and IgA nephropathy, we're gonna start with the supportive care and the normal things we do, but we really wanna be able to then say, okay, we've got eight trials. Let's look to see if you're um, a potentially good candidate for one of these trials. And so, what we've learned from other surveys is physicians are not asking patients often enough um, if they're interested in the trial. You can see a survey done by NEFCARE, um, I wanna say this was maybe two years ago, and on the right done by a, a friend and colleague of ours, Kevin Fowler, and basically patients, when, when they were asked, has your doctor ever talked to you about clinical trials, the majority of our patients are saying no. So that's the big um, kind of red flag to us physicians to make sure we're talking to you about patient trials. But also, I want to create that demand from patients to ask about trials. And so, you know, one of our oncologists at UNC states that most of our therapies are guided by past trials. And your trial participation helps the person sitting in your chair next year or five years down the road. So similar to our cancer um, or to our oncology colleagues, it should not be a question of if they'll participate in a trial, but rather which one. And so, you know, we talk about little things that can be done to promote the visibility. Everyone is familiar with the pink ribbon of breast cancer to find a cure. Um, I don't know about blood drives until I go to work and someone's wearing a sticker that says I donated blood today or, or it, it'll even remind me to vote. And so um, we've created these buttons where I'd love to see on all white coats on research nurses and PIs wearing a button that says, ask me about a clinical trial. And then once a patient participates in one saying a button that says I participated in a trial, because even sitting in a waiting room, if another patient sees this button, they can start asking you about what your experience was. Next slide, please. And so how do we find these trials? Well, this is a wonderful resource. Um, it's, you can start at the NEFCARE website, but a link to the Kidney Health Gateway Initiative is, um, is what you'll find here. This is the trial finder, and this is a way, and I really encourage all of you, I, I thought we'd have time to do a live demo, but to go to this website and go to the, the link that says find a trial. And there that you'll, they'll ask you to type in your age, your zip code, um, your disease. And I, I think they'll ask you about your creatinine and your um, proteinuria level. And then you hit submit and then you'll find trials in IJ nephropathy, you know, within 10, 20, 30 miles of your location. So when I tested this out for myself, UNC, which is 10 miles down the road, came up for me. So it works. And so again, even if your physician is not involved in a trial themselves, please ask them and, and go to this website and just get their kind of two cents. And maybe they know a physician who is involved in trials that they can refer you to. Next slide, please. And so I asked, this is my own little survey I did of about, I think, seven patients or their caregivers with nephrotic syndrome. And so you can see the quotes about their experience, um, largely positive. And so you can see that access to the doctor was amazing within the clinical trial because you're, you're getting seen more often, you're getting um, more closely monitored. Um, in particular, patients feel that the most positive thing about their involvement is they know that they're helping move the, the needle forward. I had a patient who experienced SAEs, but she said she'd still do another trial because even if the drug doesn't work for her, she knows that the research will ultimately benefit someone else down the road. Next slide, please. And so I'll end with this um, call to action to really build on the momentum. Three years ago, a group of global nephrology thought leaders met and they kind of wanted to do a landscape assessment of what's out there. And they put out this, um, this stretch goal that they propose that 30% of our kidney patients should be involved in relevant clinical trials by 2030. So that feels like a bit of a stretch. I don't know what percent of our patients um, are in trials today, but regardless of what the number is, we just wanna increase the number of patients thinking about clinical trials. And even if you can't participate in the trial, some of the other things you can get involved in, whether it's filling out surveys or, or joining some work groups that we're involved in, we just wanna hear your voice to better inform us of what we do in the future. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so I realize it's beyond 5 p.m. on a Friday. Um, it looks like the majority of people hung in there. So thank you everyone for your attention. And, and I wanna thank Dr. Dr. Nachman for um, co-presenting with me. This was really fun. It's really fun and different to talk to patients. And I think we need to be doing this more often. Let's see if we, if you, if you have any questions for our physicians, this um, is a great way you can use the chat or Q and A. Um, if you would also like to raise your hand, you can do that and I can um, unmute you. And uh, if you have any questions at this time. Okay, we do have a question here. Um, from Christopher, he's asking, are researchers looking into ways to cure abnormal IgA or is the current research or is current research limited to trying to minimize the impact of immune systems response to a low glucose IgA? So Barb, maybe I can take this. Uh, this is a great question. I, um, I'm not aware of studies that are uh, specifically targeting uh, the, the glucose attachment to, or the glycogalactose attachment to IgA. Um, th this would be uh, quite complicated uh, to do actually, because as I mentioned before, um, we, all have um, a vast variety of amounts and the um, type of uh, sugar moieties attached to the IgA. And so, uh, at least in my mind, this is a matter of proportion as opposed to uh, an abnormal enzyme that is uh, either there or not there at all. So I'm not aware of any that are addressing that part of the pathway specifically. Okay, great, thanks. I have another question. Can you take part in research studies if you do not have protein urea? So I'll answer that really quickly because um, the answer is yes, because of I showed you the, the three different types of research. And so for the interventional trials with a drug being offered, most of those therapies, um, most of those trials do need you to have some degree of proteinuria because as Dr. Nachman showed with the STOP IGA trial, if you respond to regular supportive therapy, that's great. Um, we shouldn't subject you to the risks of a trial if you're already doing well. Um, but if, so if you don't qualify for an, an interventional trial, again, all those things I listed in my slides really do contribute to research. So filling out the song survey, um, you know, the patient-focused drug develop um, meeting already occurred, but there are a lot of opportunities. And, and when the NKF does launch their CKD registry, that should be coming this fall. I, I would just love for all CKD patients, regardless of the, the cause of your kidney disease, to register in that trial, because that, it, that will be another way of learning about other opportunities. Great. Anyone else? Any other questions right now? I know that we've gone over, but this would be a good chance if you have any other questions. Okay. Well, I know that we have gone over. I want to thank you, Dr. Nachman in Minnesota and Dr. Gillespie in North Carolina for joining us today. I joined from Texas, so we're kind of um, all over. We've had quite a response today, and I really appreciate your time uh, today in educating um, this community, and uh, we look forward to having more sessions with you in the future. I want to let people know that if they have questions after this fact, you can definitely email us at nefcure. Um, you can find us on the web at nefcure.org, and you can send us a message through our website, We'd be happy to filter those questions um, to the doctors he that are here today if we cannot answer them for you. And we appreciate everyone being here. Thanks so much and have a great Friday evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.